you hot? Oh, yeah, we're hot. Oh, we're already rolling. Rolling. Okay. Well, here, we're back. We're back. Uh, we are filming. What is today? Today's 27. Tuesday? Wednesday. Tuesday. Tuesday. The test is Tuesday. That's what my physics teacher used to say. Um, back with another episode of Behind I never the know what day it is of the week. Yeah. When you work from home. No. Shit, shit I also gets... don't set alarms. It's a nice thing. Listen, the life, <laughs> as your wife would say, it's the life of a man of leisure. It's scary to have to set alarms. It is. Disturbing um, your circadian rhythm. I don't recommend it. Let's get into what this episode is going to be about. So what this is episode about? is about the leap of faith. It's making the transition, right? From employee to employer. Yeah. And I think for a lot of people that are out there who are attending all of these masterminds and these conventions, Aspire and Limitless, and the list goes on, could be Tony Robbins, could be Grant Cardone, 10X. Some of them, right, are business owners, right? But then there's... Majority probably aren't. Right. Yeah, but, but they're ready to go. Right, they are. And Let's so it's, push them off that ledge. Yeah, and it's difficult, right? Very. Because you like what's safe, you like what's repeatable, you like what's consistent. Yeah, Especially, so how long had you been an employee? You're asking me specifically? Yeah. Um, so I graduated college in 2001 from UCSD. I went to... An esteemed institution. Yeah, no one's going to know what that means. But um, not the word esteemed, but yeah. <laughs> that's very insulting to our three listeners. Yeah. It's not nice. Hey, mom. But uh, like UCSD. So nobody knows what that is. That's fine. But I graduated from um, from a university. In, it's like Berkeley without the woke part. Yeah. Well, it's pretty woke. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty woke. But graduated in 01 and was supposed to go to law school. Um, I only got accepted to like mid-tier law schools. And... Mm. Um, and like lawmatics types law schools, not as shitty as that, <laughs> not as shitty as the stuff Sorry, that Matt, Matt got accepted Sorry. to. But as Luchin would say, he's the most successful lawyer to ever come out of that school. Very true. Yeah. So check out that episode. That's with Matt. What's his last name? Spiegel. Matt Spiegel. That's the lawmatics episode. Like what episode number is that? 29 or something? 14. 14. 14. Check it out. I would say like, we'll put a link down here, but we never, ever, ever do any of that stuff. Um, useless. Can you guys hear the resentment through this mic? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Yeah. They'll be in the description. You're, you're an eight. <laughs> huh? You're an eight. I'm at an eight. All yeah. right. I'll dial it back. Um, but I graduated in 2001, was supposed to go to law school, got it only accepted to like mid tier law schools for a Jew. It's very embarrassing. Like growing up as a kid, it was like, you're going to be a lawyer. Wasn't smart enough to be a doctor. was kind of manipulative. We know a lot of doctors who are unhappy and yeah. aren't that smart. I don't want to say their names, <laughs> <laughs> but we can, we can start naming them. <laughs> we could absolutely, there's a list of them. But I think yeah. the point was, I was so sure I was going to law school. You knew it. I knew it. My parents knew it. And then I deferred for a year. Um, God bless you to Josh Messiah, who's laying on the floor of the studio. Um, we'll film, we'll film in a second. Hold tight. Um, uh, but I deferred for a year and I got, a job working corporate finance in Orange County, California. And then I had a girlfriend that lived in the Bay area. So I moved to San Francisco and then I started working at Fisher investments and those promptly fired. Um, okay. You've got to stop. That's sneezing. worse than not having your phone on airplane. Yeah. Mode. <laughs> that is the most distracting. His thighs are more distracting than anything else. Yeah. So big. Yeah. Like tree trunks. Who could listen to an episode of this with all the distractions? Log so, jam. So the, the point is, the point is, I I um I had a job for about three years to answer your question. But the first job lasted much longer than the second job, right? That's really where you got your bearings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I worked in Orange County for a commercial commercial finance company and um learned the ins and outs. When you work for a large corporation, the they pull the veil back. I don't know the veil. They pull the drapes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you can see all the inner workings and no one really, because there, it's not like a closely held company, if you will. Um, if you will. I mean, it was a closely held entity. Between that one was, people. right? Yeah. But I just mean that like, it wasn't two guys running a company. It was like, you know, it was hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanted a view into a department, and wanted to understand the inner workings, 
it was as easy as just knocking on somebody's door and asking them what they do. And everyone was really open about it. And so I ended up learning sort of how the sausage was made. But learning how the sausage is made by itself wasn't enough to get you to start thinking entrepreneurially. No. In fact, quite the opposite, right? So working at that company, I became frustrated with the processes and the systems and even the, the um, like the red tape aspect, the... Um, bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is the word. Bureaucracy is awful. Communism. Yeah. It was really <laughs> weird. It was really weird. And it was difficult... We did, you know, the whole, do you remember like GE Six Sigma stuff? Mm -hmm. so we did all that and the green belt and all this nonsense. And was that nonsense? I mean, it was a cult. No. It was a cult. It was, in my opinion, because I think Motorola was the one who pioneered Six Sigma. GE was the first corporation apart from uh, Motorola to adopt it. And we learned it from GE because GE was a partner of ours. For everybody who doesn't know, GE is General Electric. It's the company that makes jet engines, but then also did like finance and, you know, so on and so forth. They were like the too big to fail type company that ended up failing. <laughs> and they failed. <laughs> and then they did fail. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, and we did the Six Sigma bullshit and we read all these books, good to great, why Walgreens does well versus CVS or vice versa. Um, it was just bullshit. It was, um, it was a way to give people a sense of meaning um, apart from their the, the rigors of their everyday job. So it was like a distraction from a reality. It was like, you know, it's the matrix. Yeah. It was the matrix. It was almost like a religion. They were creating some rituals. Yes. Right. Around belonging to this yeah. company. Yeah, absolutely. So it was like, it was, it was like a multi-level marketing scheme. It was like, there was multiple layers. It was like, you belong to a cult, which is the company, mm -hmm. but then like you get brought into the inner circle. Yeah. Right. And you were like, who was a cult leader? Um, I became one of them. Yeah. I became one of them. I was one of the ringleaders of Six Sigma. Nice. Yeah. So I was, I forget the name. There was, it wasn't like a practitioner. Black belt. It was green belt. Green but belt. Yeah, yeah. But there was like some word, ringmaster, ringleader. Um, I will say another R word, but Lev will just go ahead and edit it out. But <clears throat> retired. <laughs> Relent. Relent. Retired people. Relent. There was some yeah. word and I was like a practitioner of it. And I would like lead um, mass, <laughs> whatever you want yeah. to call Which it. Which is hilarious because your job really was in business development. I was a sales guy. Yeah. And so what, like what in the world does Six Sigma have to do with that? I was one of the greatest salespersons to ever work at that company. Yeah. And I was told, I was told that. And what's really weird is how young I was. So I'm in my early twenties and I'm making, you know, maybe a quarter million dollars a year. And, um, and people are giving me a lot of latitude, respect, responsibilities. Um, and it just didn't make sense. I was working with guys who had like short sleeve dress shirts on with ties. Um, I don't know. It reminded me of a movie with Michael Douglas from the early 1990s called falling down. Right. Those were the types of people who I was trying to like build up and build equity with. Um, and it felt cultish and you know, it's a cult, right? When you're the cult leader, Right. There's what, what's that guy's you name? You really know that the emperor has no clothes when you're asked to do it at such a young age. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. I, you know what I felt like? There was a there was a shooting down in Texas a few weeks ago at this big mega church. Yeah. What's the guy's name? Joel Le Osteen. Joel Osteen. Yeah. Thanks, love. Hmm. They Joel. didn't kill him. I don't think it was about him. Oh. I don't know who was it about. That's too bad. <laughs> I mean, that guy is maybe what I would have become in a way, mm -hmm. right? It was like, you know, he was being interviewed by um, that British guy, reporter. What's his name? It's that British reporter. Pierce Morgan. Pierce Morgan. And he was like, Pierce Morgan's like, so what's your relationship with money? He's like, hey, money's good, you know? Money's great. Money is a gift from God. But I don't like to say I'm rich with, with regard to money. I like to say that I'm rich in blessings. Is that what he said? And then they turned to his <laughs> wife, who's like a, 
made up Texas prom queen, beauty queen, Talladega yeah. Knights. Yeah, uh, Ricky yeah. Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're either first or you're last. That's right. Um, yeah. I only fuck winners, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's what Joel is. And she was like, you know, I, the reason why I like money. And you're like, do tell, do tell, tell me why you like money. Um, I, because I like it's it's all about blessings, and God has just blessed us. Um, but yeah, so he has turned into a cult leader without kind of realizing it. He rides this wave of fame and, um, people don't even realize why they respect someone, right? You get so caught up in the words, in the illusion, in the, help me describe it, right? Right. Yeah, I think when we're young and we feel like we're part of something, yeah, we come to revere these people who are in positions of power. Right. And whether you're a male or a female employee, you feel different things about that person. Right. But you start to look at them in an, almost an inhuman way, and it makes them very uncomfortable. Like you deify them. Yeah, you deify them and it's it's really bizarre and you can't even stop yourself from feeling that way. And you yeah. know how weird it is. Yeah. Right. And it leads women down a different path. So talk about it. Right. Which we saw over and over and over again, right? Where young women coming from universities, what starting like? their first job, what do they look like? Close your eyes and just tell me what they look like. They look like suits for oh. the most part, okay. right? They're okay. not creatives, right? These are people working in finance, let's say. Okay. But they immediately start to be enamored with the men that are in positions of power. You how, see this in finance, you see this in lawyers. This? Um, I don't know. I don't know if marriage, if being married plays a huge role in it. Okay. It didn't necessarily play like a huge role in what I observed. Right. But I definitely saw this amazing kind of deification of the men in positions of power, uh, which has to, it's not just about money. It's about power and control, right? Significance, right? Within that organization. Influence. Influence. Yeah. Yeah. So the men, or the, I should say the boys, cause they're like boys probably, right? The young well, men. These were men probably in their thirties. Okay. Right. Well, the boys, you know, these young men are yeah. deifying these guys and they want to be like them. And the girls want to stup them, stup them. And they, they do. They want to stup them. Yeah. Right. And they don't even know why. And that's the whole thing with the Joel, o Joel Osteen thing. It's like people don't even realize, but they become, what's the word I'm looking for? Where you get like, you know, mesmerized. Mesmerized. Yeah. What's what that, that? What's that? What's, what's that called? What do they do? What uh, do those people do? Yeah. What's the word? Where what's they, that guy called Lev? You know, the guy who hypnotist. can like, hypnotist. They hypnotize. They hypnotize. hypnotize. They hypnotize Shout you. out to Biggie Smalls. Yeah. Biggie, Biggie, Biggie. Can't, Can't you see? see? Sometimes your words just hypnotize, hypnotize me. That's right. We've dated ourselves. That's okay. Um, but they do. You become hypnotized by the influence, the power, the respect. Um, and the and all of this sounds amazing. Yeah. It yeah. sounds pretty good. It sounds that, like a lot of money, a lot of influential people making you feel like you're a part of something. What in the hell are you doing thinking about leaving all of that? Right. And that I was dumb. Yeah. Dumb to leave. I think when you're 24 years old, you're making a quarter million dollars. And mind you, this is a quarter million dollars 20 years ago. Yeah. I don't even know, you know, adjust for Just inflation today. Yeah. Maybe half a million dollars yeah. a year. Um, and I left and it was stupid. I should have never left. Maybe I should have never left because, um, because I was just digging in and I could have rode the wave and it could have been really, really interesting. Um, but let's get into those feelings. What, what is going on inside the brain and the heart that's, that's causing you to even consider, right? Consider me leaving. Yeah. Because there's a lot of stuff going on yeah. inside of young minds. Remember, I left that company to go to another company. So it's not that I left that company and then transitioned like, okay, I'm I'm done with corporate America, right? I'm going to go be an employer. There wasn't even that notion. I remember I, when I left that company, I felt like 
the bureaucracy and the red tape, I was disgusted with. So what did I do? You weren't ready for entrepreneurship yet. At that I don't moment. think so. So I left and went to another company with a tremendous amount of bureaucracy. And more cultish. Way more flavors. cultish. Way more cultish. <laughs> Got him Samwam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You Got him Samwam. Yeah. yeah. Globally dominant direct marketer yes. of high net worth asset management. Got him Samwam. I can't believe you remember that. Yeah. So that was Fisher Investments. Yeah. And I was studying to be like an investment counselor. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they hated me. They treated me so poorly. I'll never forget it. I didn't even understand why. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Listen, I have my reasons. Um, but I think what's most important is that I'm not like John Calvin and predetermination or, you know, that type of thing. Right. I don't subscribe to that brand of vodka. But he believed, right, this guy, this Protestant rule, uh, this Protestant um, theologian, right, John Calvin, believed in predestination, which means that all the big decisions in life are, have already been made by God. I don't necessarily think in those terms, but God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, sent me to another company to realize the increased levels of bureaucracy and red tape, favoritism, a lot of that. Um, perhaps a bit of nepotism as well. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And it was disgusting. And I remember losing my job and them offering me like a a more like, you know, more entry level, job. more entry level job. They're like, listen, we're not firing you. We just don't think this rolls right. And I, I, your ego hurt. Oh, I mean, just, I still have feelings deep, like inside of me about that moment as you should. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was normal. Yeah. Because I was 24 years old. I'd gone from a, you know, working at a company where I made a quarter million dollars a year to taking $60,000. That was my base salary in the Bay area, which is more expensive. Yeah. And I remember crying in that office as they were getting rid of me. Um, and they're like, do you want this job? I was like, I just want to leave. And I left And I remember going back to my apartment and going for a walk, calling my mom and saying, I got laid off. They didn't like me and I'm not going to find my way in life. And I was 24. And I bet a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Right. That story is not unique. No. I mean, it's everyone has these types of stories it's what you do next that determines, you know, how things will play out for the next 20, 30 years. So I probably, I probably felt terrible for the next couple days. <laughs> that was it. Started going to the gym a lot, doing a lot of cardio, not like a Scientologist, but I will say, <laughs> I will say there are, there are parts of Scientology that I actually like, um, not the religion aspect, but that, and I always tell people this, there is something about increasing your heart rate mm-hmm. with cardiovascular exercise that makes you feel amazing. And doctors will say, yeah, I mean, the whole reason is, right, your, your, uh, your endorphins and, you know, okay. But th- there's something going on metabolically, metaphysically, whatever you want to call it. It's psychologically. Psych, yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's metabolically, but that makes you feel amazing. And so I realized at that moment that I was 24 and I had excelled at doing commercial finance. And that could probably just liquidate some investments that I had because I was lucky. I made some good decisions as a young man and start my own. And I wish, yeah, we have a stage timer, but it doesn't have the actual time on it because we don't roll like that. No, it has the actual time on it. That literally, is the time. It, literally, it has the time. Yeah. It's right. not relative time. No. It's just absolute time. It's absolute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's pretty helpful. Yeah. Very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lev. Appreciate it, Lev. You did a great job.
Yeah. What time was it when, when we first we started? started? Yeah. But that's not important. The yeah. finality of time is all that Lev is concerned with. Yeah. So that's the story. The story was made a bunch of money, got sucked into a cult, which is, you know, a big corporation. Failed twice. Right? Failed, failed twice. Right. For all intents and purposes, right? We should call that failure. Yeah. Right? I think that's failure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then decided like, fuck it. Let's fail three times. Yeah. When I started, and, and, and this is kind of an important thing to share to kind of like round this out, right? To kind of close the loop on the circle, which is when you start a company, and this is kind of what they don't tell you. No one teaches you how to fire and how to hire, how to create systems and processes, how to create pay packages and comp. What's your cap table look like, right? What, what is, what, uh, how are you going to make money? borrow money, leverage money. What's the cost of the money? Um, nobody ever takes that into consideration. Everyone goes, well, I know how to make a pizza. I'm going to open a restaurant. You know, I like flower arrangements. So I'm going to be a florist. Um, you know, I like doing construction. So I'm going to become a contractor, mm -hmm. but there's a whole nother side of a successful business that separates itself and there's a grand divide between a solopreneur, right? A solo entrepreneur and then a business owner. And I think I didn't want to be a solopreneur, mm -hmm. right? My father owned his own company, but it was like, again, it was a stern moving. Yeah. It was a tiny business. He had two employees, a couple of trucks at best. And, um, I didn't want that. I wanted to build something bigger. And I think, you know, the one thing that like looking back on it, I think the one thing that I, I wish that my 24 year old self knew back then that I know that I know now is hire smart people. Don't be afraid to hire smarter people than you are. Build and incorporate a vision that's inclusive of everyone's opinions, create individualized roles and responsibilities, let people be in their lane, don't get in their lane. And, you know, plan for an uncertain future by keeping money in the company, make the company be a partner, if you will. If you're paying yourself 20 grand a month, pay the company 20 grand a month and keep that equity in the company because for sure there'll be a rainy day. Those are kind of like the, the most important lessons I think I've learned that I would want to share with someone who's, you know, thinking of making the transition from employee to employer. And you know, Mark Cuban always talks about whether you know, what, what's the most important thing in entrepreneurship, right? What, what are you supposed to be good at? There's only one thing matters, your ability to acquire customers, right? Mm. If you're a good salesperson, you're going to figure it out, right? No matter what business you're in, whether it's food service, technology, financial services, you better go out there and be able to close deals. If you can't do that, you have no right being a business owner, right? This is not about being a practitioner of anything. It's about acquiring customers. And I think you already knew that you were good at that. From the get-go. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I started out as a salesperson, and now 20 years later coming full circle, what do I do? I sell. Yeah, the same thing that every CEO does. Yeah, right? and, that, and, you, and you realize, I think you go, like this is an interesting point, and, and you know, we could probably end it here because I think it's on a good note, but when you first start out, you're ashamed to say you're a salesperson. I'm an analyst. I'm a this. I'm an investment <laughs> banker, right? I'm an analyst. No, you're a fucking what salesperson. What does an analyst do? He enters numbers into a spreadsheet. He's a monkey. Look a at screen. him back there with a banana. <laughs> you're a salesperson. Get comfortable with the idea. We rule the world. Heads of state are salespeople. Governors are salespeople. Mayors. All, all of these people are selling something. And selling is a it's a two way street. Somebody's selling and somebody's getting sold. You got to pick which side you want to be on. 
for a long time, I rejected the thought that I was a salesperson. I remember making business cards, commercial finance associate should have said sales shithead. (laughs) Um, But now coming full circle, right? Senior sales shithead. Yeah. Give the guy some respect, (laughs) but you come full circle and you realize the only thing that matters is what is your cost per acquisition for that customer? O'Leary would call it the CAC. We call it the CPA. Whatever word is your preference, whatever brand of vodka you drink, the, the reality is, is that if you can't control what the cost is to acquire a customer, your business is sunk. And that could be construction. It could be food service. It could be anything. That's a great point. If you're not a good salesperson, you're fucked. Do not go into business if you're afraid to sell. Yeah. Or find someone who is good at selling and partner with them. Don't be so arrogant as to think that uh, you've got it all figured out. Yeah. It's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the advice for young people thinking about making the leap, as Lev says, right, mm-hmm. to from being an employee to becoming an entrepreneur yeah, is check your sales skills. Yeah. Make sure they're sharp as possible and get going. I don't care if you're making $100,000 a year, $50,000 a year, $250,000 a year today. Right. Make that leap. Your life will be forever changed in a positive way. Yeah. Get comfortable. Jen Gottlieb says this. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Right. She talks about like going live on Instagram and wondering if her hair looks good. What's she going to say? Is the background, is her apartment looking great? Right. Oh no, I'll wait. I'll do it another day. What am I going to say? What, how are people going to receive me? Who fucking cares? She's right. Just, just do it. Just do it. Just do it. But get comfortable with selling. That's a great point. If you're not ready to make that jump, right? You'll know because you'll be uncomfortable with selling yourself. Yeah. And if you're still in your corporate job and you haven't had a rotation through the sales department, Stay longer. Yeah. <laughs> Chill out a little bit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Have a seat. Figure out what it takes to acquire a customer. Don't leave yet. Yeah. All right, dude. That's it. Thanks. We'll see you guys next time.